This is the first year that the No BS Brass Band played on one of the five stages here at the Richmond Folk Festival. But that doesn't mean they're new to the Richmond music scene. Some colleges in Virginia provide money for on-campus newspapers. But here at UVA, the Cavalier Daily doesn't get any money through the school, which makes their advertising dollars even more important. As you can see, recent high water levels have left a lot of trash in the area surrounding the river. But the real problem, something you can't see. The squirrels packed the diamond on opening night with a sold out crowd. If attendance like this keeps up, they could be looking at a long stay in Richmond. If they approve the program expansion, jail officials tell us they could be sending hundreds more inmates back to their homes to finish their sentences. Meet the No BS Brass Band. It's not your average brass band. It's kind of like in your face. A very animalistic, strong, explosive brass rock and roll, funky hip hop, like emotional sound. A sound that has band members on their feet instead of behind music stands. If you look on stage, you see the players playing, they're singing, they're dancing, you know. And it's not just for kicks. It just adds a face, a personality to something that's otherwise uh, faceless to a lot of people. It engages people kind of like right off the bat. We, we tend to, I think, tend to be able to connect to people pretty easily. After connecting with crowds during a band-led parade at last year's folk festival, the 10-member brass band was invited back, this time on the program. This is the first year that the No BS Brass Band played on one of the five stages here at the Richmond Folk Festival. But that doesn't mean they're new to the Richmond music scene. When drummer Lance Kohler moved here from New Orleans in 2006, he and trombonist Reggie Pace wanted to bring some big easy music to River City ears. But with a lineup full of VCU alumni and current faculty and students, the band found a different sound. The songs we started writing as a band were, um, were totally funk Richmond and not at all you know, what we set, started off to do. Uh, and we just went from there, you know? Just let it kind of happen natural. And it's been happening to audiences along the East Coast for the last four years. The next step, says Pace, is simply playing for new people in new places. Spread the joy, spread the gospel of the man. The gospel according to No BS Brass. See you inside. I'm Chris Davis. Alcohol ads are everywhere. Well, pretty much everywhere. One place you won't find them Virginia College newspapers. I, mean, I like that photo a lot. But, but since 2006, Virginia Tech and the University of Virginia have been fighting the ABC board for their right to print alcohol ads. We were initially successful in our lawsuit. Rebecca Glenberg is representing the two schools pro bono for the Virginia ACLU. She says the state can't restrict advertising. Unless the restriction is substantially um, and directly um, related to a uh, substantial government interest. That interest, according to the state, is reducing underage and binge drinking on college campuses. But Glenberg isn't buying it. I think the evidence is quite clear that um, the regulations have no such effect. Even the courts are divided on the issue. After winning in district court, then losing the state's appeal, Glenberg is headed to the Supreme Court with the First Amendment in hand to fight the ban. It discriminates against um, college media by prohibiting them from publishing things that can be published by other newspapers. So in that sense, it seems like they're arbitrarily regulating speech. That's Ross Lawrence. He's the editor-in-chief of the Cavalier Daily, the student paper at UVA and one of the plaintiffs in the case. I think we're reaching far fewer underage drinkers than a lot of other publications are. I think we're just sort of an easy target. A target that can't really afford to take the hit. Some colleges in Virginia provide money for on-campus newspapers. But here at UVA, the Cavalier Daily doesn't get any money through the school, which makes their advertising dollars even more important. Back at home, VCU's Commonwealth Times isn't part of the legal battle. That'd be sweet. But executive editor Erica Torini says the focus is on civil rights. Obviously, that's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear about the issue, like, oh, First Amendment, where did that go? That's what the ACLU is wondering. But the Supreme Court takes very few cases. Glenberg hopes the disagreement between lower courts will help push the issue through.
But for now, the ban stands. For VCU Insight, I'm Chris Davis. This is a GPS ankle monitor. Right now, the city is using 22 of them to keep track of inmates in the jail's electronic home incarceration program. It has to remain on at all times. But if some city employees have their way, that number could skyrocket. I'm very happy to see that the city um, is looking to expand the program because it's something that has been underutilized. Lieutenant Colonel Carol Dabney works in the inmate services department at the jail. She says that sometimes home incarceration is the best option. We service uh, those with medical needs, okay, so that they can get the proper medical care that we can't provide here at the Richmond City Jail. Uh, we also service uh, low-risk, nonviolent offenders. Those offenders are sent home. But that doesn't mean home monitoring is a free pass. Anything that's um, outlined by the sentencing judge, um, you know, it's, it's all required. And then there's the ankle monitor. The GPS device sends a constant signal back to the jail, and employees can watch any movement. If someone, um, you know, leaves home or what have you, we're going to know about it. The monitors are even tamper-proof. Actually wiring all through the strap. A different signal is sent to the jail if an inmate takes off or disables the device. I can't emphasize enough um, how good our technology is. If they approve the program expansion, jail officials tell us they could be sending hundreds more inmates back to their homes to finish their sentences. So how are Richmonders reacting to the program? Now, I believe they should have the opportunity to serve their time at home and save the cost and try and cut down on the overcrowding in the jail. We're speaking of something uh, as simple as receiving parking tickets or uh, maybe not reporting to court, um, something very minor that they should be able to get time. The monitor will be fine, you know. You take them home and have somebody go check on them like they'd be on probation, have somebody check on them or check the monitor and give them a chance, you know, let them, let them see, you know, that life is going to be different if you just do what the law says. Chris Davis, CBS 6 News. It's been a long time since those sounds filled the diamond, and Richmond Mayor Dwight C. Jones couldn't be happier that they're back. We've been waiting for a whole year to be able to say baseball is back, and you can see the sold-out crowd, you can cut the enthusiasm with the night. Everybody's really excited. When the Connecticut defenders moved from Norwich to the River City, they brought with them a second chance for Richmond minor league baseball. And managing partner Lou DeBella is excited about the prospect. There needed to be an injection of some money into this place. There needed to be an injection of some enthusiasm, some creativity. And, it, and it, I think we've done that. Governor Bob McDonnell agrees. It's great for the city. It's a great activity. Brings a lot of economic development and hotel room nights and taxes and jobs. So this is a big deal for Richmond. But profit isn't what the squirrels are looking for. Community Relations Director Christina Schisler says what they really want is to be a part of the Richmond community. Our biggest thing is community impact. We want the community to know we're a resource for them, that if we can be there to help, we're available, we'll be there. The squirrels packed the diamond on opening night with a sold out crowd. If attendance like this keeps up, they could be looking at a long stay in Richmond. I'll be back because it's fun, it's fun just to come hang out with your friends. There's a huge diverse crowd up there, people that come from every different realm of Richmond, so I think it's awesome. I'm sure we'll be back. But it might be hard to keep attendance up in the long run. In the last 10 years that the Braves were in Richmond, turnout to games dropped off by almost half. If the squirrels aren't careful, they could be facing a similar fate. Just a few games after opening night, crowds are dwindling. The new team might have to rethink how they get people to games. The most important way to do this, says Schisler, is just by being there for the community. We're going to be here 12 months out of the year. We're not going to close up shop after our last game hits or just be here during the summer. Mayor Jones is already looking forward to the future of the Flying Squirrels. We're going to work with them. They've invested in the stadium. And now long term, we have to figure out a permanent home for the squirrels. And if they find that home. I think this could be like the gold standard for minor league baseball. So, as Nutsy reminds us, have fun and go nuts with the squirrels. For VCU Mass Communications, I'm Chris Davis.